Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Center for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Welcome. Thanks for joining me. Great to be here. Thank you. We're at an interesting point in the mapping of the human genome. It's been about 25 years now. Yep. Take us back to the beginning. First of all, why did we yeah. map the human genome? And then let's work our way through to where we are now and what the promise of the future looks like. Oh my goodness, how long do we have? <laughs> 43 hours. Well, yes, we start yeah. the, the, the genome project began in 1990. And if I cast my mind back, I was actually an active researcher in London at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School where I was doing my PhD. There were races to find the most important genes in the human genome, by which I mean from a, from a human medical perspective, the disease genes, the genes that when mutated give rise to cystic fibrosis, muscular dystrophy, Huntington's disease, Alzheimer's disease, and then breast cancer and, and many other cancers. Uh, these uh, quests uh, involved and attracted the greatest minds in Canada, the United States, England, Europe, uh, all over the world. And they took years, they sucked up millions of dollars in funding, in taxpayer funds, in resources, and great minds all competing to find one particular piece of genetic real estate. It wasn't efficient. Um, it, and it was so they were wasteful. happening in silos then? Were they? they were happening in silos and, and the, we didn't have the tools to really uh, go quickly. So it would take years to go from, first of all, pinpointing the rough location for a gene and then actually uh, uh, isolating it. So a good example is Huntington's disease in which uh, researchers at UBC, University of British Columbia, mm -hmm. played a hugely important role. Right. Um, that was a 10-year quest from 1983 saying, aha, we know that the gene is somewhere on chromosome number four, mm. to actually identifying the gene the gene itself. Ten years of, of um, uh, huge amounts of work and manpower hours. So the Human Genome Project was really sold to the United States Congress in particular as let's build an information highway. Let's lay out once and for all the sequence of all of the genes across all of our chromosomes from chromosome 1 to the X and the Y chromosomes, the sex chromosomes. And now when, when somebody is trying to identify the gene for either a rare disease or identify the genetic um, uh, factors that contribute to the more common diseases that we all care about that are much more complicated, multifactorial, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, cancers, will have the information there. It'll make our tasks so much easier. And when you go to Congress and you say, we've got something that could you know, potentially help your constituents, you know, mm -hmm. uh, who are all worried about Alzheimer's disease or prostate cancer, that sort of gets their attention. So they funded it as a $3 billion, 15-year project in the hands of a, a government uh, coalition, an, in, an international consortium. And that's how the Genome Project was at least uh, instigated uh, way back in 1990. Okay, okay, we've done it. But what, what had we done and what did that mean to the average person? What did it mean to our ability yep. to actually do anything with that information? Right. And so here we are 15, 16 years later. Yep. What have we done yeah, with it? Yeah, that's a great, great uh, question. It, and the truth is, it didn't mean a whole lot to the average person. And I think uh, probably because of the media hype uh, and the way it was sold to Congress early on, uh, that, that was probably a mistake on, on many people's parts that somehow the promise of the human, we've got the human genome. What it, mean, what it meant was we have now sequenced the, the, the genetic uh, units, the fundamental units of DNA, of our genetic code. Um, so uh, for the rest of our discussion, I'll use, I'll call them letters or bases. Bases mm -hmm. is the sort of the chemical uh, shorthand notation, but think of them as letters, basically, the, the, the genetic alphabet. There's four letters, mm -hmm. A, C, T, and G, which are the, uh, the first initials of the, the four chemical bases. And if you think of the double helix, everyone's familiar with the double helix structure of DNA. It's like a twisted ladder. And the ladder, the rungs of the ladder, are made up of two, uh, two of these letters that come together. They, they form pairs. A binds with T, C binds with G. So when you have the, the sequence of these letters on one strand, uh, it automatically the rest, the, the opposite strand automatically kind of falls into place. Mm -hmm. And that's how our genetic code, our blueprint of life gets replicated from cell to cell, to division to division, generation to generation. Um, the, the Genome Project provided the first draft. It wasn't 100% pristine, but it was the first draft to a fairly high level of accuracy of what all three billion letters 
look like from the very tip billion. three billion yep. from the tip of chromosome one to all those 23 pairs of chromosomes that I that I mentioned earlier and within that sequence of DNA we know that there are now about 20,000 really important bits fragments called genes these are the building blocks they typically code for proteins that make you, you, and mm -hmm. me, me, mm -hmm. uh, and, and everybody watching gives them their unique uh, characteristics. Um, uh, and within many of those genes are genes that uh, variations within cause genetic disease, determine risk to cancer, uh, determine our, govern uh, uh, very much our ability to process different drugs. Uh, hence the whole, this whole uh, interest um, very keenly uh, 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 held here in Canada about ph pharmaceutical research uh, pharmacogenomics. and pharmacogenomics yeah. uh, uh, and learning how variations in specific genes in our body can influence our ability to, um, to process things like coffee. <laughs> uh, to uh, drugs that we may take if we have uh, a stroke or cancer drugs, uh, hugely mm -hmm. important in terms of Chemo, how statins or, or also, also, statins, yeah, yeah. Uh, drugs that we may take to uh, alleviate uh, depression or schizophrenia. Um, so this is a, a very fast emerging field. But I think when the Genome Project was finally completed and uh, declared complete in 2000 and the, the scientific papers came out a few months later in early 2001, there was probably a, many people in the, in the public who thought, well, uh, that's it, right? We've, we, medicine becomes now a, a whole new era of designer drugs and cures for cancer. And frankly, the Genome Project itself was never going to deliver that, at least never you know, overnight. But, but it provides, uh -huh. I think that yeah. the, the, I'll end your question by saying, it provides the, the foundation upon which now we can learn and begin to diagnose and treat cancer and mental illness and many of the other diseases that we care about. I just got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Shortly after, of course, the um, the sequencing of the first genome, we start to get companies that are now saying, send us a sample of yep. your saliva and we'll sequence right. your genome. And there was a tremendous amount of interest in that, but it wasn't full genome sequencing. Right. And ultimately, what was the value of that information, right. especially in giving somebody some sense of, okay, what is my genetic code and what might I face as I age, which right. is a concern that so many people have. Yes, yes. Well, I can answer the first part of that question. The aging part, we will let's perhaps come back to. But you're referring, to, of course, to companies like 23andMe, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which was founded by uh, the wife of Sergey Brin, uh, uh, of the co-founder yeah. of, yeah. exactly, co yeah. of Google. There were several others as well uh, doing a similar thing, where in 2007, when they <clears throat> launched, uh, they invited uh, consumers without medical supervision necessarily, to uh, give them a, they gave them a, a DNA kit with which consumers could mail back a saliva sample, pretty painless, mm -hmm. uh, completely painless, yep. um, from which DNA could be extracted. And the DNA is, is analyzed on something called a DNA chip. So this was not yet doing full-blown sequencing of your entire genetic code, mm -hmm. but rather what 23andMe did is say, let's look at the half million to one million specific letters in the human genome that we know govern uh, our risk of different genetic diseases, different traits, ability to metabolize drugs. This is the real kind of the, the cutting that are, edge that of the human the gene, genome. The, the genes of you as that, an individual. Exactly. That's the 23. Yeah. 23 pairs of chromosomes. Yeah. So that's, the, that's where the name of the company came from. Mm -hmm. And um, what 23 Me basically was, was, and other companies like them were saying was, we don't need to sequence your three billion letters of DNA because there are some letters that aren't frankly that important. They don't change. They, they sit in, in kind of a gene desert that probably doesn't really matter a whole lot. But we're looking, we're going to focus on the, not just the genes that we know are medically uh, important or that are perhaps are useful in terms of uh, determining your ancestry, but in particular we're going to look at the specific individual letters within that sequence, mm -hmm. within the sequence of those genes that uh, have been reproducibly shown to influence our ability to, uh, uh, to, to, to tell us something about health and disease. So this is what uh, 23andMe did. Okay, so when I look at what's happening in Canada right now with the pharmacogenomics project and it's being uh, engineered through pharmacies, pharmacists, does that then start to meet that threshold 
that the FDA would, would require. And is with looking at it from a pharmacogenomics perspective, yeah. me as an individual, yeah. do I start to say, yeah, I think I like that idea because as you start to understand more about yeah. drug interactions, that's what I want to know. Yeah. The disease part is one thing, but yeah. I, whether I'm going yeah. to get that disease or not, I still got to take drugs. I think one area where perhaps the pharmacy community can really play a part is 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 more in public education for how um, your your genetics, your your personal genome, can influence one's ability to metabolize drugs. If mm -hmm. I if I'm if I, if a drug if a doctor prescribes an antibiotic or something else for me, a triglyceride medication, whatever it might be, my first thought isn't, oh my God, how am I going to metabolize that drug? I don't really think about it. I mean, the doctor's written me a prescription. I, I fill it out and I they go home must and, know. and take it. Yeah. Well, they don't know. They don't have that's, a clue. And I think... And that's the problem, right. isn't it? Yeah. And for, but for people in other areas suffering from other disorders, bipolar disease being, uh, I think, a, a, an excellent uh, case in point, um, one hears, and I, I know from some family members, um, and one hears anecdotally that, you know, the challenge with treating people who suffer from depression or bipolar disease isn't necessarily finding the right drug, it's finding the right dosage of the right drug because among all of the variations in our DNA, many uh, occur in a series of different enzymes that uh, underscore, that control our ability to metabolize drugs. So as we take a drug, whether it be for heart disease or a cancer drug or a drug to uh, treat uh, some form of mental illness, or caffeine in our coffee cup, uh, we're all metabolizing these foreign uh, uh, molecules to different extents. Some metabolize them very fast and the drug is gone, some very slowly or not at all, hardly mm -hmm. at all. So it behooves us as consumers, as patients, and the medical establishment and the pharmacists that you mentioned to do a better job of revealing what these variations are and, and educating the medical community how this information can be important to guiding what you prescribe and in what dose you prescribe it. And I think one has to really uh, tip one's hat to the, the work that uh, they've been doing here in British Columbia at the at UBC, this uh, pilot program where uh, they've identified um, specific stories of, of individuals who've been over-medicated, really having challenges um, uh, because it's been a trial and error. But if you can now say, uh, a patient can go to their, their pharmacist or their, their prescribing doctor and say, here are the key variations in the genes that I uh, m metabolize the drug you're about to give me. I know I'm a slow metabolizer mm -hmm. or a fast metabolizer. That gives the doctor f precious information now to tailor the dose and make a much more rational, educated decision as to how to treat that person's disease rather than just throwing drugs at them and hoping for the best. Uh. Unfortunately, we've got to take a second break here. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. Well, one of the other things that I think about as, as you're explaining all this is, okay, well, who collects that data? Who houses it? Who does that ongoing research? who has the key so that it's yeah. not held by one private company right. that says, oh, well, we're going to use this just for our benefit, right. forget all the other drugs. And, and so that becomes central in this too. Right. Do we trust the organization that right. is going to be uh, managing all of this information? I think a lot of people are worried about um, genetic privacy and somehow the genetic information getting out somehow into the public domain. And um, if you don't have sufficient legislation, then yes, perhaps an insurance company, somebody uh, governing your private health insurance uh, or life insurance, um, that potentially could be misused. But I think perhaps a little bit more has been made of this than, than need be. Um, I don't think people are going to be scru uh, scrutinizing my genome too closely. I think yeah. I, I've heard people say that they're much more worried about their financial information being hacked than, uh, than their genetic data. Yeah, no, I was thinking about it from the perspective of, who controls that information so that it's available to all? Ah. So everybody who's doing research around yeah. uh, drugs, drug interactions, yeah. uh, who is able to consume, understand, yeah. and then put that information to use, yeah. it's as though it has to be in a uh, non-biased uh, env environment or entity. Perhaps. I'm sure yeah. most people would be happy if, if um, 
the government or a non-profit you know, set up that sort of entity. Um, although you brought up 23andMe uh, earlier in our conversation, and one of the virtues of that private, privately held company uh, was that by they now have more than a million people in their database. What's mm -hmm. attracted many of those people is the altruistic notion that they, by submitting their saliva and, and becoming you know, an N of one in this N of a million database, mm -hmm. they're helping the research enterprise. Their, their, their uh, anonymity isn't being sacrificed, but piece by piece, th those genomes are accumulating to the degree that is uh, helping basic research. So over the last few years, uh, 23andMe have published a number of papers in exceptionally prestigious journals using that crowdsourced data mm -hmm. to identify new genetic risk factors for crucial, important, important diseases like Parkinson's disease, asthma. Um, so you know, we can pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, our DNA was only a tiny infinitesimal fraction of that study, mm -hmm. but we did our part to help these guys. Um, where I think some people uh, resist that notion is if that data is then being licensed to a pharmaceutical company, well, yeah. uh, which is then gonna profit off it. But it doesn't appear that the people who are working in this area that that's their motivation. It really is for the collective good. It is the, for the collective good, although I will say that I think 23andMe's business model is evolving uh, mm -hmm. of late. They are showing signs of becoming much more of a drug development company, not only by partnering with some big pharma companies, but bringing in some very um, experienced pharma executives themselves because they're sitting on this database of a million, a million genomes and you can do lots of fun recreational stuff, and I, you know, they can tell me how much Neanderthal DNA I've got buried and lurking. Isn't it in point four percent. It's a, it's, a, it's a little over two percent actually. A um, yeah, little over two percent. Yeah, sure. For um, every, anybody pretty who, much. Who's, whose ancestors came from north of the Sahara. Something like that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes, a little lower for for, for some others. Yeah. Um, so there's that sort of fun recreational uh, aspect of it, um, but uh, if that information. Into, can give me uh, insights into what are the genetic uh, factors that uh, control heart disease or asthma or uh, autoimmune disease or celiac disease, then as a drug company, uh, I've got to find ways to mine that data. And 23andMe, of course, it behooves them as a business to try to find, find ways to do that right. without compromising anybody's individual privacy or mm. identity. Last break, I always hate it, but <laughs> I have to do it. <laughs> we'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is a not-for-profit program made possible thanks to the charitable support of the following and from viewers like you. Please visit conversationsthatmatter.tv and help us to continue to produce this program. So, we've been talking only about the human genome. Yes. We've also been mapping genomes of virtually everything else. Yeah. What is, now as we sit here in 2016, what is the promise of genomics? as we move forward? Well, I think... Uh, in all areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you've got... Uh, there's a huge interest in terms of uh, sequencing uh, uh, plants and agricultural crops. Feeding the planet is going to be a hugely important um, challenge. Uh, and uh, we get into uh, how can we either either uh, breed or, or produce new strains, whether it's through natural crosses or using gene editing techniques if necessary. Um, this gets into the whole genetically modified food debate, um, but it seems that there's very really little option. If we're, to, if we're to feed seven billion and counting people on this planet, uh, we've got to have crops that can sustain drought and floods and, cy and cyclones and typhoons and all the rest of it. And we've got to make th increase the nutritional value of these things. So by, uh, by sequencing the genomes of these um, uh, uh, different crops and different strains of rice and many other crops, uh, that gives us hope that we can build a more sustainable uh, planet for our, for our future. Um, I, obviously there's work sequencing a whole bunch of different organisms uh, um, uh, you know, we're into some pretty esoteric things now, you know, the, the, the sea walrus, the cucumber, you know, we've, we've, mm -hmm. already, we've, we've sequenced a lot of very important uh, organisms in the past. Uh, there's talk about uh, the woolly mammoth genome and potentially recreating that. Um, and, uh, you know, but I, there's still, if we're giving the impression that the work on the human genome is done, it's not. There's still, uh, as the price of sequencing the human genome comes down, we're now in a, in a we currently, uh, as we sit here today, 
probably sequenced about a quarter of a million human genomes mm -hmm. in their entirety. Globally. Uh, globally. Yep. But let's push it on. How about a million? What can we learn from a million or 10 million? Um, what if we do reach a point in the next 10 or 20 years where people are carrying some form of their human genome on their smartphone? You know, what can we use that for? And I think we still, there's still so much about human biology that we don't understand. So while we focus a lot here about talking about medical and pharmaceutical um, uh, uh, applications of the human genome, we still are trying to understand how the human body works. And you think of, uh, for example, one of the offshoots of the Human Genome Project, the Cancer Moonshot that Vice President Joe Biden is leading. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has been applauding this. It's you know, the success of uh, President Nixon's war on cancer. But think of every cancer patient that you've, story that you've heard or read or, or um, a patient, uh, friend, family that you've known. Think of the, the heartache as they've tried one drug it's all. It's looked promising for a while, and then uh, they've they've been they've relapsed, mm -hmm. and they've tra they've taken other drugs, and so on. I think we all can think of cases in our in our of our acquaintance where that's happened. But understanding how the, the the genetic pathways that govern cancer, that give cancer the ability to resist it when we hit it this way, it 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 there's a mutation that right. gives it, it allows it to escape this particular. Uh, mm. uh, drug that we're giving it, so then we come at it from this side, and then it goes off in another direction. So there's still a huge amount more work that we have to do. But we're at a pretty exciting point. We're, well, we're, we're, we're starting to see it creep into our lives and have an effect on the way that we're living, being treated, and getting better. Well, we are. Mm. I, I ended my, my book, The Thousand Dollar Genome, talking about some of the new sequencing technologies that are on the horizon. Um, there's one uh, uh, from the UK, uh, from a company called Oxford Nanopore, which is, uh, uh, in 2017, about to unveil a little device that will literally, it'll be a DNA sequencing widget that plugs into your smartphone, just like a credit card reader, and you could load in DNA and the, the, the material, the, the data would stream directly into your phone. I mean, let's see if it actually works, mm -hmm. but yeah. based on their track record, I'm sure it will. Um, so the cost of sequencing, the portability of sequencing, the fact I can now take this device or a device similar to it, I can take it to Liberia or Sierra Leone or some, some country in Africa that is uh, reeling from an Ebola outbreak or a Zika virus outbreak, and actually now I don't need to ship samples to America or ship patients to America to be sequenced, quarantined and sequenced, or Canada. I can now take the, the lab to the, to the outbreak and potentially you know, uh, learn what's causing the outbreak, learn where the key strains are, learn how it's evolving, where it's mutating, uh, uh, and, and treat the right people at the right time far earlier than we could before. That's, uh, you know, that's amazingly exciting. And that's just the beginning of the promise. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you so really much. Thank you for having me. Yeah.